very fortunate to have with us Dr. Jeffrey Sachs by way of Skype. And Dr. Sachs, good morning and welcome to the World Peace Conference here in Ann Arbor. We have an entire ballroom of attendees as well as overflow rooms that welcome you and look forward to your remarks. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Jeffrey Sachs. Okay, I hope you can uh, see me and hear me now. Yes. Good. Thank you, Major. Uh, thanks to the technician for figuring out the problems, and, and thank you for the invitation to be with you and uh, for graciously enabling me to come in by Skype. Could I ask you to turn your microphone off on your side so that I hear it in echo? Okay, I hope that that will work. Oh. Please turn your mic off. in the Department of Energy. We have the highly secret National Intelligence Agency's budget, uh, probably on the order of about $60 billion a year. We have the uh, military, quasi-military or security operations in the Department of Homeland Security and in the Treasury Department. And we have the massive cost for in the veterans budget as well. If you add up all of these categories, the total comes to about $900 billion a year, which for our $80 trillion economy, it's 
about 5% of GNP. And of course, it is greater than the military spending of the next 10 countries by in the world, easily. If you look at our development assisted budget area where Rotary works so heroically, for example, in your long standing and nearly completed effort to polio, the US development aid budget is at right now on the order of about $30 billion. And that is about one seventh of 1% of GDP. So instead of 5% of GDP in development aid, at less than 0.2% GDP. In other words, we're spending roughly 30 times more on military operations in the world than we are on development aid. This is reckless. It is a failure. It is foolhardy because we cannot have a safe world when people are tired. We cannot have a safe world when people are refugees of environment disaster. We cannot have a safe world when famines are spreading because of climate change. And we certainly can't have a safe world in our country when our own war ends whether in Iraq and Afghanistan or in Syria, Yemen, Libya, are, are leading to the displacement of millions of people. How many Americans even know about our war in Yemen? I doubt one in a million. I have a, a, a rule of thumb uh, which says that America should not go to war unless more than half the public can name at least two cities in the country that we're supposedly in the with five thousand years. And we are at war in Yemen. And it's secret, it's a disgrace, it's killing people, it's costing a fortune, and it's solving I can tell you, by the way, uh, it's an interesting thing for me that I can find the cable on WikiLeaks. I visited Yemen about a dozen years ago at the request of then President Saleh. And my wife and I uh, went on a, uh, a visit to see the rural areas outside of Sana'a. And it was already shocking a dozen years ago because Yemen was facing extreme water crisis. It was facing a food crisis. It was facing a social crisis of uh, cock chewing, which is a kind of narcotic, uh, which has addicted a lot of people in the country. And there was a tremendous part of the population living at the edge of subsistence. So I expressed alarm, said this place is going to explode. And that's what the WikiLeaks cable reports straightforwardly that they sent that message back to Washington. But when I got to Washington afterwards and I expressed alarm, people said to me, Yemen yeah, cares about Yemen. Why, why, why should we pay any attention? And sure enough, after a few years, Yemen collapsed. And <laughs> our country then got into dangerous warfare in a country where had we taken the most minimal notice and minimal precautions and basic development assistance for agriculture, for water and sanitation, for infrastructure, and especially for health and education. <laughs> There's a good chance that this conflict never would have uh, broken out the way that it did. So I think the U.S. government is blind uh, and stupid, frankly, in how it uh, behaves. And this is uh, largely 
nonpartisan debate because, unfortunately, Barack Obama expanded the war effort, mostly through drone warfare. He didn't diminish it. He got us into wars in Libya and Syria and Yemen. And he's the good president, and not a president that is unstable and dangerous. And this is our reality. So I don't think there's good news. I think there is cause for a lot. And there is cause for moral alarm that not only is our country spending perhaps 30 times more on violence than it is developed, but this president has put on the table, shockingly, a budget that would expand military by another $50 billion a year and do it, he proposes, by cutting sharply development aid by around 30 percent, as well as our spending on science, technology, public health, and climate. Unbelievable. I know what his values are. Despicable. But our values of the American people are better. And that's why this is really a crucial time. This is a crossroads. And it is unacceptable to be trying to shift even more money towards futile, destructive military operations and to be cutting back on desperately needed life-saving help for the very poorest people in the world. In 1967, all this in uh, Valor Progressio, this wonderful encyclical about development, made a, a, a wonderful phrase. <laughs> he said, development is the name of peace. And what he meant by that is that development is the true pathway to peace. Because when people can meet their needs, when they can see a future for their children, they don't need to go to war. And for us, I think that we need to take up this idea, update it also, I to say sustainable development is the new name for peace. And I think uh, Pope Francis's remarkable encyclical Lodato C speaks to our minds and to our hearts on exactly that point. Why sustainable development? Because in our generation, we have to pay as much attention to uh, social justice and environmental sustainability as to economic development, per se. So when we speak of development, we're speaking, we have to be speaking and thinking of a holistic framework. A holistic framework that combines economics, social justice, and environmental sustainability. We are fortunate in one extent, and that is that the entire world agreed that sustainable development should be the framework for global cooperation for the 15 years, 2016 to 2030. And as you know, on September 25th, this purpose. And a few weeks after that, the state global community, all 193 member states of the United States, adopted the Paris Climate Agreement. The SDGs and the Paris Climate Agreement are the true way to peace. Because they call on us to end poverty, to ensure universal access to health and education, to promote Deep jobs for young people, and to ensure that we succeed in the fight against climate change and in fight to conserve biodiversity. So I believe that the sustainable development goals are our true lone star, the northern star, 
for our direction for the years ahead. And as special advisor to UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres, I'm traveling all over the world to work with governments that are working hard to implement the sustainable development goals. And this should be our cause for the universal achievement of these goals. Rotary International has a historic and phenomenal and inspiring track record of accomplishment, whether it's the polio campaign, whether it's water and sanitation, or education, or other development efforts in the Rotary International chapters around the world visited many, many of them. I am such an admirer and uh, in such gratitude to uh, the organization. This is what we need to organize ourselves for in the coming years. I believe that there are three really central challenges internationally that I hope that Rotary will take on and in its inimitable way champion and enable success. One of them is universal access to health coverage something we haven't even achieved in the United States. <laughs> have a sense of fairness rather than the crude unfairness that was on display in Washington in recent days, really disgusting uh, unfairness. Cut taxes for the rich so that 25 million people can be thrown off the health care coverage. No thank you. That's grotesque. Ryan and Trump should be ashamed of themselves. Despicable what they propose. We have a mandate in SDG 3 for universal health coverage. And Rotary knows from its work in polio and vaccines and other areas that this is achievable at low cost around the world. We also have a mandate SDG 4, universal completion of primary and secondary school by every girl and boy on the planet. That is vital for kids. It's vital. <laughs> if kids do not get a decent education, they will be in poverty, their societies will be unstable, and there will be no way to achieve sustainable development. And do you know that as of today, only about a quarter of Africans' kids get to complete high school, even though parents and children all over Africa would love to if they had the means, if they had the local schools, the trained teachers, the resources to do that. So this is where our partnership is absolutely essential. And the third area is environmental protection. It's just ghastly this idea in Washington uh, of Trump and Pruitt and EPA and Perry that they're going to dismantle, or they claim they're going to dismantle all these environmental regulations and build new pipelines and promote coal and do so many other absurd things that we have learned over time make no sense for our safety. And even if he could create jobs, what's the point of jobs that wreck the planet, that ruin our health, that destroy the Earth's plentiful uh, bounty, that destroy other species? How ignorant and cruel such an approach is. But it's not ignorance, by the way, that is the dominant per cause of this Trump prove it. Uh, deregulation. It is money. It's uh, David and Charles Koch. Because uh, Koch Industries is one of America's leading polluters. And uh, these two billionaires have recklessly and, and uh, absolutely disgustingly gone on a war against environmental regulation out of some rhetoric of free markets but out of their narrow, greedy self-interest. 
And that's a war on us. And that's a war we can't lose. Because if we lose the war to end human-made climate change and the war to uh, conserve biodiversity, we're going to create a far more violent world and a world that is unacceptably dangerous for our children and our grandchildren. And I, for one, will not stand by and let that happen. This is a fight we have to have. We need to implement the Paris Climate Agreement. So, ladies and gentlemen, let me just say that the challenge of sustainable development is both the challenge of how the U.S. can help the poorest of the poor, as Jesus said in Matthew 25, the least among us, to have the basic needs of life and to stay alive. And it's also the challenge of how America can reorient from our unequal, unfair economy with wealth so concentrated at the top that these uh, wealthy people don't know what to do with all their wealth, and then people struggling throughout our society, and these wealthy, greedy, nasty people trying to destroy the environment for another few years of their coal, oil, and gas profits. So this is a big challenge for us. We're at a very important moment in our politics. This is about knowledge of what to do with the SDGs tell us that. Uh, it's about heart to have the commitment to do it, and that is absolutely what you have and what Rotary International stands for and always stands for. And it's about politics and power, because we are in a world of expanding violence right now. We're in a world where the budget put forward by our president would take us even farther from American values, where greedy, powerful people are aiming to wreck the planet and deliberately so. And it's our fight to make sure that sustainable development is the winning cause. So thank you very much for letting me share these thoughts with you and all gratitude for your wonderful work.